G'day and welcome to Footyology, the show that doesn't tank for draft picks or cry out for concessions, but still gets the job done with a two-man list, a couple of top-ups and maybe a couple of father-son picks once they're out of juvenile detention. I'm Rowan Connolly, with me is my co-host Mark Fine, and we're going to dissect the action from round 11 with all the surgical precision of a year 8 science class cutting up a sheep's brain. That means there'll be a bit of grey matter spilling out, but a lot more red as we poke around the bits we're not supposed to, causing those in our sights to turn the air blue. We've got all the latest AFL news with John Pirrick, the reporter who doesn't just break the big stories, but smashes them into barely recognisable fragments. We've got rounds of our lives, keyboard Q&A, the credibility ladder, and the rant off. Any more, and we'd have to go over time, pinch Jared Waitley's thesaurus and dramatic intonation, and borrow that voiceover guy who sounds like he's just come off the set of The Man from Snowy River Part 6. But we'll save that sort of wankery for the others. Instead, I'll just say good day to you, Finey, and throw you an opening line that you'll completely ignore and say whatever you feel like. How are you, Rowan? Oh, my voice. How are you, Rowan? Oh, I'm OK. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm well. I've got well. a bit of the mid-season slump going on. Oh, my football team does. Yes, how about, they do. How about a bad weekend for a few football clubs? In Our Kilda? football clubs. Well, St Kilda, Essendon, Richmond, Collingwood. Essendon and St Kilda, not great expectations. Richmond and Collingwood season done. And um, the lowest attendance for... What, 25 years? Well, winter winter did finally turn up, didn't it? Not a great weekend for the establishment clubs. Good one for the interstate clubs. Good one for some, uh, let's say, precocious uh, heirs apparent to the throne. Did you, did, you, did you think we'd see a crowd of less than 5,000 at a game of AFL footy? No, yet? no, it reminded me, actually reminded me of a game, uh, I did a St Kilda Fitzroy game at Victoria Park back in 1985. I went to that game. So few people there that the ball went over the fence and Leon Harris had to jump the fence and get it himself. Yeah. No, I, I was... And we, St Kilda, Kilda won. won. <laughs> <laughs> How it pathetic are we? We've got to go back 30 years for some decent memories. Oh, uh, let me tell you, if Alan Sidebottom played in a winning team... <laughs> Those were rare days, I remember them. Um, yeah, it was a bad weekend for our teams, wasn't it? I mean, we both hanging on by their fingernails. Essendon, bridge, uh, the rest of the season looks like a bridge too far for Essendon. And I reckon their one chance of winning another game might be against St Kilda. Yeah, happy to get it over and done with. So we are just about halfway through the season. And unlike Game of Thrones, in round 11, winter actually did finally arrive with a vengeance. There was no gratuitous nudity, but plenty of drama nonetheless. So let's look at the highs and lows in hot or not. OK, I'm going to get us underway today. And Actually, can I start? Oh, go on. Yep. Not hot is all your Game of Thrones references. And, oh, and any person's Game of Thrones references. Don't like it? I've never watched it, but there are so many references to Game of Thrones, words I don't know. It's a, it's nerdish, I think. It's a great show. It's like there's. Did you play Drun- no, Dungeons no, and didn't. Dragons? No, no, I didn't. I've got to say, Finey, this is one of those shows I never thought I'd be into. Actually, my daughter got me into it, but um, there's a lot of sex and violence, Finey. I'm sure it would appeal to our demographic. YouTube's got plenty of that. You don't need to watch TV. All right, I am going to start. Uh, very positive note. Now, not for Essendon, who got smashed by Fremantle over at the main stadium, but what a fantastic moment when, well, not when Ryan Crowley ripped his hamstring. That wasn't so good for him. But when he came off the ground, I love the spot. Goes, leads into the pocket. Oop, oop, there goes the string straight away. You knew it was in trouble. But he gets up and he walks around the boundary now. If we can just speed up this footage, Benny Hill style, that'd be good. And the crowd rose as one to their feet and gave, here we go, one of the most heartfelt things I've actually seen at a footy game. Uh, now, they never got the chance to say goodbye to him because of that rather untimely suspension. And he has been he was a fantastic player for the Dockers. Yeah, but I, I don't remember him being just a, such a crowd favourite. I mean, they love him. Well, he, he did so many effective jobs for them. I, I just think it was great to see. And, you know, and he played well for them on, on Saturday night as well, didn't he? For yeah. Fremantle. Yeah, probably. That's a bit harsh. But I mean, look, <laughs> sp- spontaneity is a thing there isn't a lot of in football anymore. So I just thought it was a great gesture. Your turn. Well, I've got a, a hot that is very much a player who's had wretched luck, hasn't he, over the last couple of years, Tom Rockliffe. Mm. Now, he has come back. He has had 48 possessions, 13 clearances, nine marks, a goal, 13 score involvements, which for Brisbane's like... 30 for anybody <laughs> else and you know and Mitch Robinson actually played a really g- good game as well he kept Bryce Gibbs out 
I reckon they had two of the three best players on the field and didn't get close. But Doesn't say much for the other 20, does it? Uh, it says where they are in football terms. But gee, Tom Rockliffe, don't forget how good a footballer he is. Any luck with consistent football and he's one of the best in the comp midfielders. Uh, good call, good call. Okay, a not for me next. And uh, it's been a good year for GWS. The last fortnight, they've had two difficult games on the road and lost both of them with honour. But in particular, they're tall forwards. Now, we've been raving about them most of the year, but boy, have they struggled in these defeats. Cameron, Lobb and Patton. Uh, the Giants have kicked a total of 27 goals in the last two games. They've kicked a total of three of those 27. Now, difficult conditions, admittedly, but you've got to be better than that. You've got to at least be competitive. Now, we see a rare mark by Patton there. I suppose we're going to show all the good bits now, aren't we? shouldn't take long. This is a good bit. Coat hanger. No, yeah. Yeah, yep. But you've got to be better than that, even in, in sort of greasy, wet conditions. Otherwise, you can't play three tall. So the just not I, productive enough. I, I agree. Um, the reason I said a good bit, if Lindsay Thomas did that, is that a week? <laughs> yeah, he was harshly done by. Just, oh, yeah. just, just in looking at it, it reminded me that there are players at AFL level who have a target on their back, I reckon. Yeah, no, up there with them. Yours? I'm, I'm leaving the AFL. Can I do that? Oh, yeah, why Did not? you see State of Origin? Uh, I saw the end of it. Yeah, so Sam Thiday gets... Um, I saw he, this. He gets yeah. he, he gets a microphone thrust in his face after the game. I think we got some footage of it. Let's have a look. How was it, Sam? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it was a bit like mm. uh, losing your virginity. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> uh, very nice, but we got the job done. Now, I'm not sure if I've got a second question. I, I actually, right, bit but, uh, yeah. I actually played it on my radio win. show afterwards. Um, got it alerted by a listener. I th- I, nothing wrong with it. It got hijacked by the thought police. Mm. Now, he was talking about his own loss of virginity, and women's groups came out and immediately took umbrage at the suggestion that he was referring to a woman's loss. Was of it women's groups or Christian groups? Uh, there was uh, there was reference to uh, offensive to women, but whatever it is, honestly, yeah, the thought police out there and the splinter groups, the special interests, the marginalised in society have got a platform with social media. And quite frankly, Sam, say whatever you want, and the rest of you go stuff yourself. Yeah, the outrage industry is uh, certainly working overtime. I'm outraged days. at them. Okay. My last one, uh, and I'll make it quick, it's a hot and a very big hot to North Melbourne who copped it, really, after that loss to Sydney. A lot of people saying, oh, I told you so, they're not up to it. Well, wasn't this a great response? And in adversity, not only did they lose their best player, Todd Goldstein, everyone's saying he was critical to their performance, they lost their coach. Did you hear what happened after they lost their coach? Uh, Quickly, no. They shortened dramatically with the bookmakers. Oh, did they? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, says Brad Scott. Anyway, look, it was a fantastic performance, very thorough, all round the ground. Uh, Midfield was strong. Boomer Harvey, what a marvel. And uh, right back in the premiership race. So we're never out of it, really. But a great retort to all those people who doubted them. And Yours. Do- and Dor played well. Mine is a, a bugbear of mine. Um, you know the, the supers or graphics that appear on our football coverage? Up in the top left-hand corner. That's yeah. right. I cannot stand the way our game is being portrayed as a points battle. Yep. 57 versus 56. Well, it- let's have a look. Have we got an example here? Quickly. No, just keep no, talking. It doesn't tell the tale. It's There were two games on the weekend that were absolutely... Oh, there we go. Here it is. GWS are, are taking on Geelong. Yep, GWS now, 26, Geelong now, 15. Was that Rory Lobb? Um, <laughs> defying your theory. Um, the points is a total, but our game is goals, behinds and points. Yep. And Geelong and Hawthorne both had a domination on the scoreboard based on scoring shots. Now, so it didn't tell the true picture, is your point. Hawthorne were five points ahead, but they yep. were something like ten scoring shots ahead. I understand that point. However, it's our game, and it's not points. However, those of us with a very basic knowledge of mathematics, I think, need the... Uh, t- we, we can't take it all in in that little glance at the screen. There's a good reason I did humanities and not maths and science. In grade two, I got, I got a teacher's award for the times table of six. <laughs> I did. I knew six times table because of footy. Okay, well, six eights of 48, I think. Time for a short break, and when we come back, our news handle will be here with all the latest, not to mention a better dress code and greater sense of decorum than Finey and I could ever manage. 
But first, let's catch up with all around 11 post-game press conferences where Grant Dickinson continues to have every AFL coach ducking for cover and screaming how the hell they let this guy in when he asks the pressing questions. You've got into the habit of eating team sheets every time you have a loss away. If this keeps going, you're going to get pretty fat, aren't you? Uh, I haven't thought about it. No, I'm still digesting this game. But um... Welcome back to the show and to a man whose quest for truth, justice and a back page lead would make a great movie if Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman hadn't got him first. It's not Watergate, but there might be waterworks when you tear up at the sheer drama and shocking football revelations in tomorrow's news today. G'day JP and sorry, I just had to get that all the president's men reference in. We've had our own version of that, I think, in recent years, haven't we? Bombers Gate. <laughs> you know why there'd never be a Watergate in Australia? Why is that? Because our two major political parties are so incompetent, they'd stuff it up and break into their own headquarters by mistake. That bad, you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. well, let's start off today with the major news. That got a great reaction. Major I'm glad news I this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I just got it. Thanks for it. Wake up. <laughs> OK, let's go. The major news this morning, um, Geelong's opted to not appeal Tom Hawkins' one-week ban for hitting Phil Davis at the weekend. Um, we saw Hawkins um, mm. hit Davis here, it's oh, sort of in the up. chest region, the lung area. Um, Chris Scott said he was very surprised to hear that um, Hawkins had been offered a one-match ma ban. Do you, do you guys think he should have been suspended for oh, that? I'm actually OK with that. Yeah. I mean, we've seen people get a week for a love tap to the the gut, yep. um, punch to the throat can actually be quite dangerous, really. I know there wasn't much in it, force in it. I mean, there is, there is there are rules in place. You can hit somebody as hard mm. as you want as long as you're holding part of their jumper. <laughs> he was lazy. He didn't grab the jumper. So do you reckon it was a week? Or Absolutely not? not. Not? Nah, Phil Davis put it on then, wanted to get milk a free kick. There was no uh, way that constituted yeah. enough force. And I thought this year we were going on doctor's report, medical reports. Mm. What was the medical report there? Poor acting, do not apply for end of season <laughs> well, you're review. you like someone punched you yeah. in the throat today. Well, if they, if they had appealed, they would have risked two weeks and uh, Tom would have missed potentially the game against the Dogs. But players are told so not to, you know, not to make head-high <coughs> contact with opponents. He barely it's, did. Yeah, I know. Okay. Well, it's silly, though. You just can't do that. Yeah. Overruled, finally. Oh, what... <laughs> It wasn't over. Yep. It was it wasn't overall, which is a pity. McDonald, Tipping, Whitty was lucky. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, I agree with that one. Carlton's good season has continued with a win over the Lions at the weekend, although the Lions were deplorable. As for the Blues, they've won six of their past seven, and they now look like they're going to apply for some Friday night games <laughs> next oh, year. No. <laughs> Here we go. Not they had again. six last year. Oh, they ruined, ruined by an average of seventy-five oh, points. God. But this year they're playing attacking football. Looking pretty good. Guys, you reckon they should put in for a couple next season? Oh, I think a lot of us are still scarred by that experience <laughs> of 2015, John. I mean, as Friday Night Footy, it was a great advertisement for whatever's on Channel 9 and 10. They're not the only team that don't have Friday Night Games this year, Melbourne being one. Like, do you think they should be... Yeah, are yeah, they worthy of a game or two uh, next year? Mel Melbourne's, Melbourne's yep. gradual <laughs> climb seems to be more likely to be sustained next year. But, yeah. I mean, can't, God, they just do not... Get it, do they, Carlton? There's a lot to atone for. But Carlton just don't get it. This is a rebuild, and they've had a great half a mm. season. Yep. It's not over. It, it, the re this is a process. So they're ready after Friday night football. Next thing you know, they'll want to buy North Melbourne again. Well, Stephen Trigg, in, in fairness to him, has said that, you know it's a long process. He feels like they've just left the station at the moment. So, yeah, But yeah. they understand where they're really at. They've so. just left the station. So why are they trying to pull into Flinders Street with Friday night <laughs> flute? <laughs> Nothing wrong with a game or two. Mm. Did you, do you Guns N' Roses had a song for them, it was called Patience, and they, they should show a bit of it. <laughs> true, true. Do you feel, the, the, like, Gary Abel hasn't played on the Friday night stage for, for several years now, do you think we've missed something, him not being on the, on the uh, marquee night of the year? No. Uh, that's right. No. But you know, he's been the best player though for a few no, years. No, he has. Yeah. Yeah, no, Several look, it's years. a fair like question. Best last but I mean, if, years. if you, do you put, I mean, look, it comes yeah. down to team versus it individual. It is a team sport, yeah. isn't it? People go to see teams. They don't go to see individual players. Gold Coast aren't exactly dragging them through the aisles, let's be yeah, honest. Mate, I buried for St Kilda during the 80s. I mean, the football-loving public were denied <coughs> players like Mark Scott and stars like that. Yeah. Sometimes. Simon Mann? Yeah, yeah. We never saw enough. For Tui Atata? 
He wasn't St Kilda. Didn't he end up at St Kilda for a while? No, he well, did he not. Oh, sorry, I meant the Carlton Reserves. Yeah, the entire team. Mm. Peter Keel, you never saw the best of him on TV. <laughs> saw the best of Sparrow Cork, I though. So. Thank you. Uh, just a few other things around the grounds. Actually, in, in the Supreme Court this morning, a leading player agent, Liam Pickering's had a loss. He's been found guilty of, of two really? breaches, two or three breaches against his former um, business partner, Jason Sarasis, in terms of their player agency that um, has had experienced some trouble. So the judge has now ruled both both men to get together and work out what the damages should be. It's going to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Pickering was with um, Strategic Sports Management, took some players with him to his other company. Sarasis has argued that he's lost endorsements and commissions out of that. So it's an interesting one. So in terms of is he trying to get some money back through Gary Ablett? Is that why you brought that up? Well, that's, that, that's one of the things. Yeah, loss of commissions and the like from Ablett's contract. Were you in court for the um, finding? Yeah, I went to it this morning, yes. Did you, Did you yeah. bow to the judge? Oh, uh, we had to do that, yeah. Really? Yep. Which court was it? Supreme Court. Okay. The old high court. Pretty full on, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. Like yeah. you didn't get called up for a jury or something. <laughs> was there a lot of media there? There's a few of us, yeah, yeah. Hutchie? No, I didn't see Hutchie. A couple from TV. Wasn't there to support his off-the-bench colleague? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> and just a few other things. Uh, Sam Rose told Footyology, the Carlton Utility, he wants to play on next year, but he has an open contract negotiations. He was an important player at the weekend when Cruiser went down. He started down back. Pinched it in the ruck and went forward and kicked the goal. It's had a pretty good season, really. He has, it? yeah. So I don't have it. I don't see any issues about him getting another contract. Um, Jack Fitzpatrick, interesting one from Hawthorne. Hawthorne, yeah. He's been out for three weeks. Many people might not know, but he's had concussion. He came off the track last week, actually, when I was out there and still complaining of issues with his head. So interesting to see whether he comes back this week. And McCartan's a big problem with St Kilda. Yes. Certainly, yeah, a spate certainly of it's concussions a, it's a going on. Issue, yes, yes. Yeah. But Lockie Hansen yep. was back playing this week. They, they were worried yep. about his concussive state, and he was very good, I think, in the VFL. Yep. That it? And, uh, that's about it at this stage, yeah. Okay. Thanks for having us. Ah, <laughs> pleasure. Yeah, having you on, you'll be back for the credibility ladder, of course. Yep. Let's get to another break now. When we return, join Fanny and I, as like any ageing men, we travel to our favourite destination, the past. Nathan, how is the club coping with that guy dressed up in Collingwood garb that robbed a 7-Eleven this week? I mean, how are you coping? How does Collingwood cope with it? Yeah, I mean, he obviously wasn't a Collingwood supporter because he stole toothpaste. Yeah. No, as the figurehead of the club, I absorb it and make sure that we are accountable to the things that we're responsible for. So. Welcome back, and we had an amazing reaction to our new segment last week, particularly from Malcolm Blight, who was delighted to watch himself kicking the winning goal back in 1976, and not so delighted with his to-camera piece by candlelight when the lights went out at Waverley 20 years later. Well, round 11 over the years has thrown up some memorable moments in football history. Let's get all wistful together, because like dried mud falling from the stops of a well-worn puma, so are the rounds of our lives. Tortured analogies every week for the rest of the season. Feel free to contribute. Oh, I like that. Malcolm Blight, see, that's what's great about this segment. You go back and you everybody remembers the big kick, but not how awkward he was in front of the camera. So. <laughs> well, that, uh, they were conditions when the lights went out that would have uh, tested the uh, most professional newsman of our time. You know, you know, just in that footage, when we showed it, um, a couple of mates of mine actually identified each other as being part of the riotous group. Oh, of course. And I'm not surprised They're both respectable married men. <laughs> well, I still reckon you were in there somewhere and you just, you're not fessing up. Our journey back through time starts today at Windy Hill, in 1991, and yes, I'm so old I can say I was covering this game. Essendon versus Melbourne. Scores are tight. Right in the final few seconds, let's throw to the action. Melbourne have got to get a clean possession and kick a goal to draw it. Clark caught high. Free kick. Six seconds remaining. Yeah, now they need a mark. You'll have to go a torpedo punt. So it'll go. It has. Can Stephen Clark kick the goal from 55 metres out? Well, some people on the ground already. It's unfair. Let's see if Clark has got to poise, maintain his concentration. 
really chaos here now. The longer he waits, the harder it's going to be to police this. Yeah, Madden and Flutter sprinted from the full forward line and try and bottle up that, po that pocket and square area. Clark, torpedo oh, kick. kicks it magnificently. Will it get there? Oh, oh no, it's been touched. It's been touched. And have a look at that for a chaotic scene. How can you give a score Unbelievable now? Unbelievable scenes here. Not good enough, really, is it? No. There's some crowd yeah, in the no fight, chance. too. I reckon years from now we'll be talking about incidents like that and people will say, oh, back in the dim, distant past. But it actually doesn't feel like that long ago. And amazing scenes. I remember Melbourne were filthy about it. But, you know, Essendon had about 28 players on the mark there with half the crowd. And Stephen Clark, yeah. uh, the late Stephen like, yeah, Clark. Yeah, said, played for St Kilda and yeah. Essendon as well and as Essendon, Melbourne. Yep, yeah. uh, could have played in the 85 Premiership side. But Beautiful kick. Yeah, yeah. well, look, he gave it a real nudge. But, uh, you know, it's a bit difficult when you've got to kick over about 88 people on the mark. And, and that's what he said. He sort of went to kick it, and he wasn't complaining about the guy on the mark. I, think, I reckon there was, must have been a kid there. There was another kid dragging a gammy leg. It's well, remember the famous footage of uh, Kerry Good winning the night grand final for uh, North Melbourne against Glenn Collingwood? There, there's several people almost diving across his boot. Was Glenn Archer one of them? Yeah, he? yeah, he ran out there as a Collingwood <laughs> supporter. <laughs> uh, good start. Anyway, well, that's where we start. That was our number five. We're actually voting and, and ranking them every week now so we, number we four we just rank anything on this program yeah oh, why not you know we're all uh, hey we work for a newspaper mate we only want to know about listicles these days number four is the mark of, oh no in fact i don't think it was should have been the mark of the year in 2001 and it's chris tarrant playing for collingwood against melbourne at the mcg check this out collingwood have responded by putting dimitina in the forward pocket trying to drag way wide and away from the play lock his kick inside the 50. Oh! That's a great mark. Over the top. What a mark. Could well be the mark of the year, that one. Chris Tarrant. Huge leap. Came down the front of the pack as if it were a waterfall. The Royal Decree has it that this is definitely the mark of the year. I haven't seen anybody up that high for some time. And it's crack. Certainly wasn't a soft landing, was it? Always a good sign of how high the blokes come when it takes him about five minutes to recover. You know, I'm just you know, trying to remember what was the mark of the year in 2001. Well, I can't remember. You know that what he did there would go on a couple of years later, I think, to be outlawed by the AFL? Why? What, what did he do? He was wearing the three-quarter Bradley Plain sleeves. And oh, they, they banned him? Yeah, they banned them. On what they, grounds? Well, just uniformity. They just wanted <laughs> short sleeves or long sleeves. They tackle the big issues, don't they? Yeah. Of course, uh, Tarrant, was it the following year, 2002, that he did take the mark of the year against Geelong at Eddie Had Stadium? He was a pretty good player, Chris Tarrant. He was he? a very good player. And, and, of course, he went to Fremantle, came back as a defender, yeah. and he didn't finish his career badly. I think actually an underrated footballer. I heard the discussion as to whether or not Cloak has been the best key position forward at Collingwood since Peter McKenna. And Tarrant should be in that discussion. Well, I mean, he's, he basically reinvented himself, didn't he? And, and like became him. almost as good at the other end of the ground. OK, you're going to love this next one, particularly you old Fitzroy fans. We're going back to Princess Park, 1992. Oh, yes. It's Fitzroy versus Collingwood. Tell us a story after. Oh, it's Fitzroy great. versus Collingwood. <laughs> I love this. Paul Ruse, of course, one of the last remaining stars for the, the Lions, who've lost one, Gary Pert, to Collingwood at the start of a season. It's the end of the game. Scores are tight. Let's see what happens. Manson with the fly. Well played, Stevens. Left foot, though, by Collingwood, by Fraser. CK, oh, he's the guy. Pert goes. Collingwood in front. What about the irony of that? Gary Pert. First, Will Ruck. And we're down to 40 seconds now. Mockhorse back Good towards play. the boundary intelligently, but Broderick in the road. Left foot, guard with a chance. Paid. Too far out to score, you'd think. He's kicked three. There's 30 seconds remaining. Must go quickly now. Last chance for Fitzroy. What a fitting finish this is. Ruse! No, unable. Still an opportunity. Abbott can't crash his way through. Ruse's left foot kick is a goal. Talk about irony. Ruse to match Pert. What a contest. 13, 14, 13, 11. And gone. If ever a captain has kicked a goal, it was then. How good was that? You couldn't have written a better script, really, could you? Oh, I couldn't have because I took a footy quad that day with my best mate, Matey Miller. 
and we were at St Kilda Geelong at Cadinia Park. St Kilda lost by 12 points, which was considered an amazingly good result. We were rank outsiders, a couple of other wins. We got it. Had to listen to that in the car. That was a very late finish. Paid $10,000. Oh, well done. Well, I want it noted very quickly that it was my former John Gardner High School colleague, Paul Abbott, who crashed through that pack and created the crumbs for Rusey. Jeremy kick Gard, the winning goal. Gard kicked the ball in. He did. He did. Oh, there's some blasts from the past. OK, let's move on to number two. Another memorable finish. This time from the 21st century, we're going to Etihad Stadium, 2002. The hapless Carlton. Can they finally get a win? It looks like they might pinch one. They're playing Geelong, and unfortunately for them, the Cats have other ideas. It's given the Blues the lead. They lead it by two points. The Blues flood back. 26 seconds remaining in the contest. Can the Cats get it inside their 50 and get a shot on goal? A blistering final term from the Blues. They trailed a reminder by 37 points at three-quarter time. King and Hotton winning it down. Camparelli dispossessed. Corey Kilpatrick misses the body with the handball. Now Clark, short ball, got a target. Riccardi. Wow. Wow. Riccardi has taken the mark inside the 50. It is in good hands. It is in good hands. The I've got to tell you. It's going to sound, Gary. This shot on goal will be after the siren, and he has to kick it for the Cats to win. There it is. I'll tell you what, has there been a more dramatic last quarter of footy? And goals scored after the siren have been in vogue. I tell you, this is a massive kick from lots of perspectives. I can't believe this last quarter, boys. It is in good hands. On the day for Peter Riccardi. Of the set shot in the game. Let's watch the fate of the match riding on Peter Riccardi. It leaves the boot. It's swinging back. It's oh. The Cats have stolen victory from the jaws of defeat at Colonial Stadium. What a right, stuff. How's oh, it, was the, it was fantastic. How's How the outswing on the ball? I, that was another one I was in the press box for. The outswing on the ball came off his boot. Looked like it was going out in the full. Well, it didn't just come off his boot. It was smothered. Yeah, well... that He got too close to the man on the mark and footage shows clearly the ball being touched off the mark. And, of course, Finey, had it happened this season, we would have gone to the video review and the guy would have gone, result inconclusive, that's umpire's it. call. I, I know that's what normally happens, but... There was clearly the fingers being bent back. Do you reckon? I, it's, when you watch something like that, you know, I've got one word for that result. What? Camparelli. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that ball got tapped out in the middle, 20 seconds to go, straight yeah. to him. And hello to Stephen Silvani <coughs> if you're watching too. Michael Long, 1993 grand final. Still love it. Okay, let's go to the number one moment. Now, we, we do take the you-know-what a fair bit on this show, but this is one of the great moments in footy history. The year is 2003. Jason McCartney, of course, has oh, been yeah. a victim of the Bali bombings and uh, was in real danger of losing his life, recovered very courageously and somehow managed to get himself back to a stage where he's ready to play for North Melbourne again. They play Richmond in a big Friday night game and this is how it unfolded in the last quarter. Let's have a look. Bloody by Robbins, clever. Got it to Grant. Ran into trouble, taken down by Bell. Oh, no. Brown again, got it to King. Penetrating kick inside the 50. McCartney behind. And McCartney has taken the mark. And listen to that roar. And look, and I am just so full of praise for the people with this sense of sportsmanship here. The rich, there's rich, people in the Richmond cheer squad applauding him this effort here. I see it is set up. I'll tell you what. That mark was all about determination. Well, he's, he's got dray loads of it. Imagine the lift this will give the kangaroos. You dare say, as his wife Carissa looks on, if they, he kicks this, they will be very hard to toss. What a start to the term it would be. Jason McCartney knows how to kick them. Bounced alongside him, a companion. He kicks inside the 50. That awards full court runs the ball. McCartney toe pokes it. Picked up by Harding. He goes in. Another lead change. Pace of Harding once again. 
Once again, Lee Harding can split things open. He can break the game with his pace here, but Jason McCartney just had the set. Yeah, I suppose uh, this is no better time than uh, I think I've used up every inch of uh, my determination through my fitness and uh, I suppose mental effort. And uh, I find it fitting now that I'll uh, hang the boots up as of tonight and go out on a great note. Because I'm spent. It's been a tough time, but that's enough for me, mate. What a great way to go out. I still remember the shock I felt as he announced his retirement there on the spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. look, some narratives ascribed to football, uh, tortured and schmaltzy, and this is, he was the embodiment of the survival and the fighting spirit of the worst attack on Australians, non, non wartime attack in the history of our nation. I mean, this was a, a tragic event, and his courage to get back out there. He physically, to get out there, had to endure enormous amount of, um, with skin grafts, mm. enormous amount of pain. He shouldn't have really played in that game. And fairy tales do happen sometimes, and that was one of them. A uh, ripping, great, ripping, great ripping great bloke. And yeah. uh, still involved in, in AFL football too. So, uh, yeah, look, a, a wonderful story. And like yeah. you say, those spontaneous moments, they're the moments that I think stick with you the longest. Little kid from nil yeah. amounted to a whole lot. Great stuff. Time to return to the here and now, sadly. But when we do, we're set to log in and load up our Twitter app with all your footy questions and our fumbling responses. Hold the door! 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 Did you game watch Game of Thrones last week? I missed it. I walked off. I didn't see that. Thanks for joining us here on Footyology, and this is an important time to say it's your show too. We want your ideas, we want your input, and your money too, if you've got any lying around. But if you haven't, send us your questions instead using the Footyology hashtag, and Finey and I will do our very best to answer them. It's 140 characters of football talkback madness on keyboard Q&A. Now, I've got a massive bone to pick with you. At this very time, on this very show yes. last week, you vowed, Mark Vine, that you would tweet something that afternoon. Did you tweet something no, that afternoon? No, I did no. not tweet. Have you tweeted something N since? No, I have not tweeted. So how many days are we up to now? Must be 26 days. I have mitigating circumstances. What were they? You lost your phone again. No, I didn't lose my phone. Ari, if you're out there... I am going to kill you. I had a <laughs> slight problem with an SMS on my phone. Yes. A mate of mine said, I can fix that. He wiped all my contacts, all my, everything. I don't have any data on the phone. How, how did he do that? If he knew how he did it, then he said he could undo <laughs> it. He fiddled around. I gave him my stupid iCloud password and I've been reduced back to almost a phone. My phone is now just a phone. Uh, so next you'll be making phone calls on it. Mm, I won't be answering them, but I'll make them. You are one of those people. You remind me a bit of, uh, you know, minor, minus the Faye mannerisms. Uh, what was his name? Frankie off, uh, you know, the guy who's married to Betty. I can do the Faye mannerisms. Yeah, it was just... Some mothers was, do have them. Some mothers do have them. Thank you very much. Now, that was an ordinary uh, show. What a cracking sitcom. He was the was. Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, but everything went wrong with him, didn't it? What are you saying? Well, I don't know. There's always something wrong with you. I thought I was bad. Uh, we, we need... It. We're like... um. Laurel and Hardy, except we're two Laurels, no Hardy. Yeah, I was going to say the odd couple, and we're both the fat, grubby one. Mac and Meyer. Yeah. Bill and Ben. Yeah. We'll come up with some others. Okay. Well, that's okay. That makes Pyrrhic little weed. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Now read the name. Okay. The name is Lockie St. Clair. Okay. And he asks, should Richmond trade some of their big name players like Martin, Deledio and Cochin, or will they be there for their next flag? Okay, I'll answer the second bit there. No, they won't be there for the next flag because the next flag is a bit more than five years away, I think. And you they should the not trade bit. them. No. You, I you, hate that suggestion. It's what are you gonna get what, what are you gonna get for them? At the very best, hopefully maybe something that is, is is like them. But they need their leaders now. I really hate that whole argument. You give up a champion for a speculative draft pick which may be used on a kid who ends up being good and, and may not be good and has to be developed and might get injured, yeah. might get hit by a bus tomorrow. 
Like, it's all so speculative. But people sort of... And, and t- uh, part of the theory is to go down, to go up. But it doesn't work. The, the idea is to play your best football all the time and finish as high as you can. How about the... How about the talk during the week about a lottery for the draft? Oh, no, no, don't stump me on this one. Oh, it's, it's insane. Well, what about Jared Healy saying during the week, Carlton could be uh, doing themselves a disservice if they finish mid-table? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like what? You do yourself a disservice if you confuse your footballers by making them unsure if you want to win. That lottery for a draft... No, is, no, no. I just want to explain something about it. There's no real incentive to finish on the bottom. Who knows? You know, there's no priority pick. But... If you put a lottery for the last four teams, believe me, then the team who finishes fifth bottom, it is worth tanking. Yeah, yeah, I know. You just move the problem somewhere else. Okay, yeah. we're getting the wind up here. Let's get on with the next tweet. Who's it from? It is from Frankie. Frankie. And he asks, Tom Hawkins getting a week was fair. You can't hit people in the throat. Discuss. Well, we did discuss it, Frankie. Uh, I'm with you. I, I think, uh, well, look, I'm not saying it was an outrage or anything, but I think it deserved probably a week. You, you don't? You bring it up. No, yeah. that's a joke. Um, I just think it was Phil Davis putting it on. I just cannot believe, believe that he got a week for that. Oh, as I say, Mac tipping witty. McDonald tipping witty. Yeah, no, he, he, he was he, lucky. The he guys have got out, weeks mate. before, but for little love taps to the stomach, they're no different. Who's got they? a week for a love tap? I know one player in history that has got a week for a love oh, tap. No, it happened Daryl Wakeland on Cloak many, yeah. many years ago. Was it? Oh, maybe... For um, St Kilda. Is that the one I was thinking of? Was it that long ago? All right, get on with the next one. Okay. Who is it? Paul. Paul, who asks, are the media too critical of teams after a loss these days? Oh, no, I don't think so. But listen, Finey, Essendon's loss to Fremantle is a disgrace. They need to sack the coach, sack half the playing list, and stage a boardroom coup now. You can do this any week with your mob. <laughs> yeah. Um, and mine, Bob. Yes, yeah. they are. But no, I hate knee-jerk reactions in yeah. football. I mean, they are, but as a fan, don't you feel it? Don't you feel after a loss, you look at the team and go, there's no one good in this team. I mean, we only reflect, the media really only reflects the public sentiment. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting a job. Mm, I don't know about that. Well, I hope they're not. Otherwise, it's pretty dumb public sometimes. Yeah. Let's well, move you just on. worked that out. Uh, what? You just worked that out. Well, no. We need them. <laughs> Who's this one from? Uh, from Phil. Phil Dimitriatis. Collingwood consistently gets scored against so easily. Can you or Finey shed light on Buck's strategies? Uh, no, Phil, I can't. And I'm not sure Bucks can either. Well, this year, Collingwood definitely pre-season signalled an intent to play more direct. Their indicators like forward handballs and bounces were up during the pre-season. They wanted to play more direct more 2016 football, you'd call it, higher scoring football. It obviously failed early on in the season, but they, I think... They're so still, they're playing 1999 football Well, I, th- I, s- I think they've still got a legacy of players pushing up too far and they're getting caught back over the top. They don't have a lot of quick players in the team. And the guys, they just don't cover the ground well. You see little Blairy's feet pumping and his opponent 10 metres ahead. They're getting caught on the spread. And they've also got... Look, on the weekend, they had... They had basically basket cases up other end, uh, uh, each end of the ground. Frost made every other mm. defender nervous. He made me nervous. Mm. And I was watching on replay. And Cloak at the other end of the ground, he just couldn't time running at the ball even anymore. Well, it was always going to be pretty cumbersome set up with Cloak, Cox and White, wasn't it? And they were a particularly bad day to be playing those three together. And you can't jumble those words as humorously as when more plays. <laughs> Well, not back in the good old days. Not like the good old days when Collingwood had uh, Dick, Cox, Sidebottom and, and Goldsack and Ball. Yeah. Does it get any better than that? Oh, I ask. Ha- you know. Okay, we've it- got one more to go. Come on. <laughs> not enough time for our blue humour today. And last one from, I can read that, from Dole Pludger, our good old mate Dole Pludger, who asks, should we award the Bulldogs a gutsy three-point preliminary final loss now, play a Hawthorne Sydney grand final and get on with trade week? I know where you're coming from, Dole Pludger. It's, got, it's sort of got this here-we-go-again scenario about it. I think the dogs are better than that this time, though. I think it might be the first time I can remember with the dogs that, you know, like in the Terry Wallace, in the Terry Wheeler days, it was all about gritty Bulldogs. In the Terry Wallace days, it was all about attacking Bulldogs. 
How about the Peter Road days? The Peter Road days, it was book your September holidays. The Rodney E days, it was small forward line uh, concocting scores. They've never had the right balance. I feel now they're getting it. They're very strong defensively. And, what, and how about the master stroke to develop 14 halfback flankers because they get injured every week? Well, exactly. And I, in fact, I wrote about their forward setup because, look, they're not high for scores. I think they're ninth or 10th for scoring. But they still manage to conjure enough goals to win them. They're doing it through their midfielders. They've got about a dozen midfielders, about nine of whom go through the forward setup. So, not, um, not unlike the Australian cricket team of the early 70s, my friends. It all starts with Redpath. He's been good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. But he's been good. He's a really good target. Yeah, no, he's important. Certainly takes a lot of the heat off Jake Stringer. So, look, I think we're all, you know, not for the first time, the Bulldogs might be everyone's second favourite team. They are going to win a flag in the next five years. They've just got Liberatore as a champ. He really is a good player. Uh, It's a good year to do it. Certainly a good year to pinch a premiership. Okay, that's it for Keyboard Q&A this week. Another break now. And Uh, where uh, we... uh, I've got something. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, you know, we're trying out a few interns. Yeah. So, so we've got a girl in Sydney, Midori Ferrari. Oh, you didn't run this by me. I didn't think I had to. We sent her up to the Gold Coast. She was going to cover Sydney games for us. Oh, no. What happened? Well, you, you know how wet it was. Yeah. She quit after her first job for us. Have a look why. I'm here at Barry Island Beach and there's no time to stop. <laughs> We've got Culture Club playing in concert this week. You're their number one fan. Are you excited? Yeah, but I'm trying to ignore those feelings. I mean, I think that is human nature. Uh, you, the, the supporter in you comes out a little bit. Welcome back. Well, we've really started something with this next concept. There's no pat on the back for limping over the line or doing it in second gear here on Footyology. We demand 100% effort 100% of the time. Refuse to give till it hurts, and we'll hurt you on the credibility ladder. That head is far too big for the body. Have your loved ones seen that shot? I'm a bobblehead. A bobblehead. <laughs> <laughs> can we buy one? Can we buy one of you yet? Yes. <laughs> that's the one. Um, 100% effort 100% of the time. Yeah. That's not full effort. What am I missing there? No, because I've, I've heard footy coaches 110% effort. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. 100's not full. Yeah. No, well, I told you I wasn't great on maths. <laughs> All right, let's get the debate underway. Now... Uh, we've all... No, you haven't, Finey, because you never end up having any input into this, but... Uh, I had major input in <laughs> Did you? What did you do? When we get to the bottom, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Okay. Well, JP and I uh, sort of thrashed out the uh, crux of it. We're going to start at the top today. I think there's a very worthy debate to be had this week about who takes top spot on our credibility weather. I'll give you three cases. The case of North Melbourne. A great response to that loss in Sydney. Without their coach, without Tol Goldstein... Told Todd Goldstein, difficult Friday night, Tigers are apparently back in town, and what a response it was. I give you the Western Bulldogs, up against West Coast, desperate for a win on the road, need to prove a point. They looked under the pump in the last few minutes, Eagles kicked three goals in a hurry, had all the momentum, Bulldogs hang on, another win against the odds, and with a couple of players down on the bench. And then I give you, much as I don't want to because they're flaky as anything, but Port Adelaide. They came to Melbourne and had one of their great visits to the MCG. Absolutely <laughs> smashed Collingwood, who were insipid. But I think that was as much about the great footy Port played. We've got three worthy candidates for top spot this week. Who wins? Well, it's hard to go past North, really, considering the Tigers have been in pretty good form. Without their coach, agree. their best player. Freezing cold in Hobart as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd give them the points. I'm with you. I refer to the Port Adelaide club song. Yeah. We'll never stop, stop, stop till we, we drop, 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 drop of the credibility <laughs> ladder. <laughs> I thought it was a great win. They just humiliated Collingwood and um, did it at a ground that they're not particularly adept at most of the time. I thought Port... Are they on a roll or are they still flaky Port? Are they still going to no, come that, out next week and get you know, there? You know, I reckon they are on a roll. Chad Wingard has not been huge in their wins. Um, Westhoff starting it's to play... Weekend, yeah. West off starting to play better. Yeah. They showed a lot of faith in keeping Need in for the last three weeks. Yeah. He repaid that faith. All of a sudden, there's a bit of depth there. What they what they have done is they've picked up two players. One was on their list. You know, Aaron Young wanted to come back home and no club was interested in him. St Kilda said, no, don't bother. 
How's, how's he's good is he going? Goals, yeah. Yeah, and Darcy, Bo- Darcy Boone Jones, is he being mentioned for the Rising Star at all? Uh, he not got nominated last yeah. week. Um, so, yeah. But to win it? He's uh, going as good as Parrish, and people are talking about Parrish. Yeah. Okay, well, executive decision here. I'm going, going with North yep. on top, <laughs> Western Bulldogs second. And we are going into Adelaide, so we want you people over there to know this isn't just a token gesture, but we are putting Port third this week. The Encouragement Award, call it. Are we being shown that the cinema's there? Which cinemas? I don't know. They've got... I didn't know they had a lot of TV stations. Really? We might be movie toad news. <laughs> I hope there's not a boring short beforehand. Okay, <laughs> next bracket of teams. Now I'm going to zip through those. We've got Geelong next. That was a pretty good win against the Giants. I know it was on their, good. their home fortress, but they saw it to get the job done, and they did. We're going with the loser next, and we're going with the side Geelong beat, GWS. Yes, they uh, conceded far more inside 50s, but they hung in there. Uh, apart from those tall forwards, they hung in there. So I've got them next. Next in order, Adelaide, Smash St Kilda, Melbourne. Uh, reasonable hang in their job against Hawthorne, I thought. Um, so they've actually finished higher than the side that beat them, which some people might say is odd, but this is a credibility ladder. And next we've got Carlton, who got the job done against Brisbane. I really like what you've done there yeah. with GWS because they went there, look, they were going to get bullied early. That was the plan at Simmons Stadium. Treat them like kids, make them think that they're back in year one or two and they stood up to it. Uh, well yep. played. Okay, uh, zip through the next bit. Uh, we seem to zip through this segment a lot. Sydney, Hawthorne, West Coast, Fremantle, Gold Coast, Essendon. Could be a bit high, the Bombers there. That wasn't <laughs> my doing. Okay, yes. bottom four. Nominations are the Stinkers of the Week. Brisbane, St Kilda, Richmond and Collingwood. Well, we didn't expect much from the Bombers anyway, so... And no. So Saints. But they didn't, the Essendon didn't do better than Brisbane. Uh, no, I didn't think the so. The Lions were deplorable, though. No, so he, he's their first got 15 minutes Pyrrhic's of football was the this worst one. Yeah. You've got it in 15 years. Pyrrhic. You hate Attack Brisbane, John Pyrrhic. St Kilda, terrible. They knew that they were going interstate again. They had problems. They had to gird their loins. Loins were not girded. <laughs> Betts barely got a kick. And they yeah. sort of lost by 100. Worst team of the week. Okay, yeah, Richmond, Holter. Collingwood, which yeah. was worse? They're the same club. I don't well, know the Pies needed, to, Pies needed to make a stand, didn't they? Yep. Against you reckon the they were worse? In Melbourne. And they just Tigers didn't, or didn't Pies worse? Worse Collingwood. Yep. Because and Richmond had... A, they did have player shortages on the night. It's funny you mention that. That's the way we've gone. We're not putting it up back up on screen now. Richmond, Collingwood, maybe we should just lock it in the bottom two spots for a while. Oh, there it is again. Yeah, Brisbane, St Kilda, Richmond, Collingwood. Hey, that Trelaw decision, it's line ball, isn't it? <laughs> well, hasn't done either of many favours, really. Uh, that's it for this week. Thank you Sorry. very much, JP. Back to court for you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Don't get mistaken Justice. for a barrister. and Justice Rowan. Get involved in a... <laughs> court it's is adjourned for your court. <laughs> Plead mitigating circumstances. Tell them you work for the age. <laughs> Might need a job soon. <laughs> <laughs> Time for our final break now. Don't go anywhere, though, because our final segment is so full of evangelical fire and brimstone. They're queuing up to watch it in America's deep south without even knowing what on earth we're talking about. Adam, this is becoming a bit of a soap opera, not winning on the road, but it wouldn't be called home and away, would it? It'd just be called home. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty obvious. Welcome back. It's the halfway point of the AFL season and clubs and players alike are starting to feel a pinch. But there's no pacing yourself when it comes to manufactured football fury. And if there isn't enough outrage to be had, finding an aisle created by God, it's time to unleash the hounds of hell on the footyology rant off. Okay, I'm sure you went first last week. You did go first last week. So you're going to bet first? I'm going first this week. I'm working myself up into a real weather, and I want you to count me in properly for once. Six, 43, hike! I'm not happy about this federal election, Finey. Frankly, it's a yawn fest. Two boring leaders, two vanilla major parties. It's about as interesting as moonlighting got after Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd finally got their gear off and shagged. There's only one way to liven up this campaign, and that's to get the AFL world involved. Come on, let's piss Turnbull and Shorten off and draft him Mick Malthouse as leader of the ALP. At least he doesn't just pretend to give us stuff about the environment. That was a serious one. 
Mick wouldn't cop any crap from the journos either. Imagine him going on the Bolt Report, leaning across the desk and giving Andrew a massive smack around the chops. You wouldn't need any polling to know what that would do to the approval ratings. I want Kevin Sheedy leading the coalition. Why not? Sheeds has already done more for farmers this year with that country game than the Nationals have in decades. He and Mick could bang on about Martians and the ox being slow and the earth patient and still make more sense. They wouldn't look like a couple of insincere prats when they went out and shook hands with some real people either. And if it had been Sheeds who'd bitten into an onion and not Tony Abbott, no one would have batted an eyelid. When the next leaders debate comes around, I want Turnbull and Shorten out and Sheedy and Mouldhouse in. I want Craig Hutchison as moderator and I want the worm back too. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Chris Kenny has already got an election gig. First of all, a siren. Okay, I, I had a kick after the siren. Yeah, I just can't believe it. I, sorry, I didn't hear the last five, ten, four, four fifths. Well, of I hope Chris Kenny didn't, or he might sue me as well as everyone else. What episode of Moonlighting did they get their gear off and have sex? Well, I don't know. It was thirty years ago. I watched it. I can waste it all. I want to see that. You episode. must have been. You must have been sent to bed during that bit. Yeah. Okay, got to get on with it. Okay, here we go. In three, two. 2700 rant this time i am serious my rant this week is aimed at two leading journalists their names caroline wilson and patrick smith and their lack of a mea culpa both of them acted like afl operatics when north melbourne was slated to go north and become the gold coast kangaroos there was a battle for the hearts and minds of north melbourne supporters ahead of the members vote and caroline wilson and Patrick Smith did their very best to tell the football world that North Melbourne would die if they stayed in Melbourne and would prosper up north. Well, let's fast forward to today. Halfway through this season, and North Melbourne sit atop the ladder, 10 and 1. They play down in Tasmania, just signed a new multi-year, multi-million dollar deal, don't get any revenue from pokies, and stand profitable and powerful. And Gold Coast? 4,300 people turned up on the weekend to see a team that couldn't have beaten a Reuben Pellerman collective of metre maids and 80-year-old retired Jewish Melbournians and Sydney signers. The fact is, you were wrong, Patrick and Caroline. You don't know how to apologise. You don't know which horse to back in a two-horse race. And if your reputation stood on that big decision, then it would be in tatters today. And it might just be. Ooh, that was uh, that was actually quite serious and very well delivered, Finey. And I have to say, I, I did sort of take up the cudgels a bit in print with Caro on that story, so I am with you. Or as John Kennedy used to put it, normally I'd say no comment, but on this subject I say absolutely no comment. There you go. A very th good rant. This one's worth a vote too. Okay, quick, how do we vote? You simply vote by Google Maps has gone on board. They said that they want to help us. Get onto your roof and write... Roko or Finey in large mash 4077 type letters on your roof and the next Google Maps will expose who had the better rant. Do, 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 do. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining us again. We're on every Tuesday at 12pm on YouTube or 7.30pm on Channel 31. And Finey, I've been waiting to the last minute to tell you this. From next week, every Wednesday at 9pm on Foxtel's Aurora Channel. You can see he's in three different places. And remember, everyone, as the drifters famously put it, under the boardwalk, down by the sea, got me ciggies, got me six-pack. I'll be watching Footyology. See you next week.